Yeah, he's an absolute legend. Like everyone loves Nick Diaz. I mean, he's a very important part of uh, the MMA, the history of MMA. And if people don't realize what, what a big part he is, you need to watch him in the Strike Force days. Because when he was a Strike Force champion, mm -hmm. watch the Frank Shamrock fight. You know, watch uh, Paul, Paul Daly. Daly. Fight. Wow, oh that's, my that's God. probably the best one round fight I've ever seen. Amazing fight. That was Cyborg. Unreal. The Cyborg Gomi. fight. Gomi, yes, watch yeah, those he, days. He's a, he's a true legend. He's That's a why legend. everyone loves him. So some people forget like how great he was. Oh my God. Today, I would like to talk about and take a deep dive on one of the most legendary fighters of all time to ever grace our presence within the sport of mixed martial arts. Stockton, California's only Nick Diaz. Nick was a one and only kind of fighter with great skills in all aspects of mixed martial arts. You could expect Nick to bring the fight and definitely trash talk if necessary with the elite level skills to back up that trash talk. Let's go ahead and take a look at how Nick Diaz became the legend that he is today. Nick Diaz was born in Stockton, California in a Mexican-American family in 1983. He had one younger brother, also UFC superstar Nate Diaz, and one younger sister Nina. He attended Toke High School in Lodi, California, but he would only complete one year of high school before dropping out to pursue his passion of fighting. When Nick was young in elementary and middle school, Nick was into the sport of skateboarding. He had always wanted to skateboarding when he was younger and he got into it as he was getting older. Welcome back to the Octopus Films MMA. I greatly appreciate your time. Now sit back and make yourself at home. Hit the subscribe button to support the channel and stay up to date on future content. As Nick continued to get older, he left skateboarding behind and he began to start training the art of combat. At the age of only 16 years old, Nick began training Sambo. Shortly after training Sambo, Nick would discover the gym doors of the legendary Caesar Gracie. From there on out, Nick Diaz would begin training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu regularly and Nick would earn his black belt directly from Caesar Gracie in 2007. Another notable memory from Nick's early years was his girlfriend at the time. In high school, Nick had a girlfriend that he loved a lot. A few days before Nick's professional debut in the cage, his girlfriend committed suicide by jumping out in front of live traffic. Nick would often visit her grave to keep his promise to her and to let her know that he would make it as a professional fighter. Nick would have his first professional MMA bout directly after turning 18 years old in the IFC Warriors Challenge 15 event. He submitted Mike Wick by triangle choke and won the welterweight belt the very next fight in only his second pro bout. This was a great and very impressive start for the young 18 year old and Stockton Menace. Nick's next appearance was at an event called the King of the Mountain where Nick fought three times in one single night. He won his first two fights of the night. But then he would lose his third bout. It's crazy to look back and think about how some of these older fighters would have to fight multiple times in one night at these tournaments. A few fights later, Nick would become the WEC welterweight champion by defeating Joe Hurley via Kimura submission. The Gracie Jiu Jitsu was shining through. Nick would then later make his UFC debut inside the octagon 
on September 26, 2003, at only the age of 20 years old. In his first fight in the UFC, Nick defeated Jeremy Jackson, where soon after his second bout was set up to fight against Robbie Lawler. Now at the time, Robbie was known for knocking everybody out and he was expected to knock out Nick Diaz as well. At the time, Nick was also known to be more of a jiu-jitsu fighter, so nobody expected Nick to try and stand with Robbie. When Nick KO'd Robbie out cold in the second round, the crowd would go wild and he would shock many people by putting down the growing prospect Robbie Lawler and beginning to create a name for himself on the big stage. Nick would go 5-4 and four in his next 9 UFC bouts, with notable wins over guys like Josh Neer, Glyson Tebow, and Drew Tackett. Josh Neer was a massive prospect at the time and known to be one of the toughest guys on the fighting scene nationally. Nick would submit Josh with a Kimura submission in the third round with a fight for the ages. I would highly recommend checking out that fight if you have not seen it. Josh Neer is a legend himself and I will definitely be making a video solely for him on an upcoming day. After leaving the UFC, Nick would face the legendary Takanori Gomi who he would submit in the Pride event via Gogo Plata. This is an extremely rare submission to see, especially in mixed martial arts. Pride was different than the UFC, with a more extreme rule set allowing things such as soccer kicks to the head and knees to a grounded opponent. Pride was the premier MMA promotion of Japan in the early 2000s. Nick would then go on to fight a few bouts outside of the UFC in promotions like the Elite XC and Dream. Nick would then go on to sign with the upcoming promotion Strikeforce. Strikeforce was easily the UFC's biggest rival. Nick went 5-1 before joining Strikeforce before he entered his legendary run of a 9-fight win streak. Nick would defend the welterweight strike force belt three times on his run. In his final strike force fight, Nick faced Paul Daly. Paul Daly was talking a lot of trash and had elite level striking. Nobody expected Nick to stand there and strike with Daly. To everybody's surprise, Nick brought the fight right to Daly. He stepped right through the fire and slugged it out bang for bang with one of the best strikers in the game. Nick would finish him in stellar fashion in the first round and this would be his last time fighting in strike force before making his return to the UFC and the Octagon. After returning back to the UFC in 2011, Nick would face only legends of the sport from here on out, fighting the elite of the elite fight after fight. His first fight would be against BJ Penn. This was one of the best performances I had ever seen anybody perform against BJ. Nick would get the decision win over BJ. This was a huge victory. Nick would then lose two controversial decisions to Carlos Condit and the legend and GOAT himself, George St. Pierre. Nick had a great fight with both of these guys and proved that he definitely belonged with the elite of the elite. 
Nick would then fight legend Anderson Silva in 2015, a fight where he lost the decision, but it was controversial. After fighting Anderson Silva, I believe the UFC made one of the biggest mistakes they had ever made. Nick would be popped for failing a drug test for finding a small metabolite of marijuana in his system. Now marijuana is clearly a drug that does not enhance physical performance. The UFC would then sentence Nick to a five year suspension. That is correct, five years. Nick was right in the middle of his prime and to this day I still wonder what fights we may have gotten to see had Nick been able to fight for those five years in the middle of his prime. We most likely missed out on some of the most incredible fights and it was all over a marijuana metabolite which is ridiculous to think about. Nick was 32 at the time of the suspension. Nick would return after the suspension in 2021 to rematch Robbie Lawler 17 years later for the rematch. Nick being out of the cage for over six years and living a different lifestyle, it was not the Nick we had been used to seeing all those years before, but it was still a great fight. And honestly, for being out of the sport for so long, he put up a great fight against Robbie who had been very active all those years. Nick proved that he will always be a fighter at heart and will always be one of the most entertaining guys we have ever seen inside the cage. As a huge fan, I wonder if we may see Nick again inside the cage. However, I will not be upset if we don't see him compete again. He has given us so many legendary fights to look back on and was one of the all-time greats to ever fight in the sport of MMA. He doesn't like the pretentiousness of what he has to do in the media, and he'd rather not do it. He doesn't want himself opening up. He's actually trying to close parts of himself, preparing himself for war. They'll ask him to go do a press conference with his adversary, when in his mind, he's preparing himself to beat the hell out of that guy in the cage. Why are you mad, bro? Because you're full of and everybody knows it? Is that why? Why are you mad for Saturday night? Watch what happened Saturday night. When I had Nick in my class, it's just the way he was. He, Nick was Nick, and Nick was going to do what he was going to do. And if he felt like doing that at that moment, that's what he was going to do. He doesn't do MMA to be popular. Nick doesn't do MMA to get a pat on the back. Nick doesn't train and fight uh, to get people's approval. Nick does it to survive because he knows this is his one shot. He's had everything that the world can throw at him. He is not easily intimidated and you can't break Nick Diaz. Sometimes he gets upset. And when you ask me why he gets upset, it's his inability to express himself verbally. That's why he's a fighter. But when he gets in that ring, he's a poet. He's a poet in motion. He was always told he wasn't good enough. He was always told he's not gonna make it. He was always told you don't belong here and you know, you're, you're not one of these rich kids. And, and you know, when he fights, I think he does bring some of that back. And uh, unfortunately for his adversary, that's where that energy goes. I like Nick Diaz, he can, uh, you, he can smack talk and you can hear what he's saying. <laughs> Nick Diaz once, he was fighting Robbie Lawler, and uh, Robbie Lawler was a huge favorite going to this fight. Robbie Lawler was knocking people out, he's a beast, you know, he's a, still to this day he's a beast. So uh, Nick Diaz gets into the cage and just starts going, Stockton motherfucker, Stockton! Oh, he's shit. like talking scared, 209 right, right. and yeah. Stockton, and he's pacing back and forth, he goes, Stockton motherfucker, and he was dead serious. When he fights guys, he calls them bitch all the time. What bitch? What bitch? You want this bitch? Pow! Like he'll hit guys and talk shit to them. He was talking shit to Robbie Lawler the whole time they fought. 
He was talking shit to him. Roddy Lawler didn't talk shit back. I thought he would, you know, but he was, I think I think that guy really flusters a lot of people with his, with his shit talking. You know, like when, when he was uh, fighting Frank Shamrock, Frank Shamrock said it best. He was like, I can't, like he was doing it and I he can't believe he's doing it while he's doing it. Like, is this guy really talking this much shit to me? He's a fascinating cat, man, because he does fucking triathlons. Like he's really into doing like high endurance shit and he gets super baked and then rides his bike and swims and, and runs. His endurance is ridiculous. He's got like Iron Man triathlon endurance. That's why, one of the reasons why he fucks guys up. He just puts a pace on them that they can't keep up with him. Yeah. It's just like he's running with them. He just makes them run at his pace, and then before you know it, they're wilting, and he's beating the fuck out of them. Mm -hmm. You know, he does that to everybody, man. Did it to Paul Daly, and he puts himself in danger to land shots. And he does some stuff that is just really atypical of uh, guys trying to play it safe and guys that are like champions. Like a lot of times guys get to a certain point and they fight to win, but when they can win and coast and not put themselves in danger, they will sometimes, you know. Oh. GSP does that. Nick right. Diaz does not do that. Right. Listen to me. I think Nick, Nick, no, when Nick Diaz just fought um, his last fight, he fought uh, a serious fucking dangerous striker, this guy Paul Daly. And Paul Daly does not have a good jiu-jitsu game. Paul Daly, is, his defense is okay, it's pretty good, but his stand-up is wicked. Nick Diaz went after him only with stand-up. Didn't even try to submit him, didn't try to take him down, just banged it out with him and dragged him into deep water and then knocked him out. And it was incredible. And it was, it was, and the way he did it was a way that George would never do it. He threw himself into the fire. He even got clipped and knocked down. He's not supposed to be like striking with this guy. This guy's like one of the best strikers in the sport. And he struck with him, he hung in there with him and he beat him down. And he's just, he's a beast, man. You cannot count out Nick Diaz. And the pace that Nick, Nick Diaz makes you run with him makes you run at his pace, you know, and his endurance is just on some wicked level, man. And he forces this pace and fights guys, you know, using sharp boxing where he doesn't hit you with full blast shots. You know, like, he sort of 50% you, 50% you, up until, like, the second and third round, then he starts digging those hooks to the body, and... So effective, man. He's so effective. Nick Diaz, ladies and gentlemen, give it up! Thank you, Nick, for being one of the realists out there and showing us all what a true fighting mentality looks like. You will never be forgotten. Today, Nick has an academy in Stockton, California. The Nick Diaz Academy.